Your Excellency, a, a few years ago, I had the um, distinct privilege of visiting your northern neighbor in Uganda. And um, one thing that struck me, I think, uh, most deeply about my time there was as I, I entered every town and village, folks would come out walking, singing, um, celebrating, saying, you're welcome, you're welcome, you're welcome. And in the United States, you know, you're welcome is something we say once we've received something. Say, <laughs> thank you, you're welcome. Thank you, you're welcome. And it struck me that, that my new friends had really gotten this term and this phrase right. As we walk up, as we meet new friends, we want to receive them and let them know they are welcome. And Your Excellency, we want you to know, as Charlatans, as citizens of the United States, you are welcome here. And now I will do my best to speak very little and um, give you the opportunity to, to share what's on your heart, to share your story uh, that I think we are all so eager to hear. So if you would, in your own words, please share the story of Rwanda and what it's walked through um, as, as far back as you would like. And I think what many of us would love to hear from you as a leader as well, because we, we, we tried to fill this room with leaders, men and women of impact who could receive your words and go out and multiply the impact and effect of them. Mm -hmm. So talking through your personal journey of leadership as the events in Rwanda have unfolded over the last decades um, would be something I think would be a great gift mm -hmm. to all of us. Well, thank you, Casey, and I uh, wish to thank uh, Tim Scott, Senator, and uh, Andy, my friend, and uh, the distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen here in the audience uh, for a warm welcome you, you've extended to me and my delegation and for uh, giving us this time to have a conversation with you. In fact, when uh, Andy was making the introduction first, I, I, I thought uh, maybe there would be some level of confusion when he talked about Uganda and then Rwanda sometimes people confuse and, mm. <laughs> and in fact uh, because I have also uh, lived and grown up in uh, both countries uh, it's not clear which one I belong to uh, sometimes they think uh, some think I'm the president of Uganda, <laughs> the president of Rwanda. So I want to make it clear, I'm the president of Rwanda. And that's why, <laughs> that's why I grew up as, uh, I was, uh, my family went into exile when I was four years old. Uh, that's why I grew up in a refugee camp for over 20 years, uh, like many other Rwandans. There are many in Uganda, others who grew up in Burundi, in DRC now, which was Zaire then, others Tanzania, the whole of the East African region, and quite a number of others in Europe or United States. So the, my story, or the story of Rwanda, in a sense, mirrors many other stories of the you know, African continent. Uh, but there are also differences. So as we, I, I grew up as, as a child, uh, similar story like Andy told, uh, going to school barefoot, and crossing rivers uh, without knowing how to swim, a similar story. Maybe the difference, I've learned to swim after time. <laughs> He, he hasn't yet, <laughs> but the same story, pretty much the same story. So when we grew up, uh, and the many other young people, we thought about uh, why were we refugees? Why were we stateless? 
why would anyone or anyone's family live in a refugee camp almost uh, forever, like mine and many other families did. So they, they, therefore, it, as we grew up, the question became clearer and clearer that there were issues to resolve that made us stateless. And the issues to resolve started with back where we came from, and that was my country, Rwanda. So that's how when I, I, I try to cut the long story short. But that's how we got involved in the liberation struggles for me, two, one in Uganda, another in my own country, Rwanda. Uh, in Uganda, there was a liberation struggle that we participated in when I was very young. And then that's how uh, I got to have what it took to be able to participate in the liberation of my own country, Rwanda. And this was long before the genocide that took place in my country. Uh, we saw four years uh, of uh, a liberation struggle, armed struggle in my country and then uh, followed by the total destruction of the country where over a million people lost uh, their lives. And most of those are our parents, our relatives, our friends. Our, you know, every family in Rwanda was affected, in fact, by this one way or the other. You either had members of the family that became victim or you had members of the family that were perpetrators. Yeah. So there is not a family in Rwanda that did not uh, uh, lose one way or the other. So one million people one million for were sure. killed. Yes. And how many, what's the total population? Currently we have 12 million. 12 million uh, people in the country. But at that time it was about maybe eight. Wow, 15% of the population yes. lost the genocide. Right. So here, this is, all these tragedies in a way shape people yeah. and uh, the kind of experiences also contribute to people either doing better working harder in trying to address the challenges that uh, people face on a daily basis. So in these tragedy, tragedies, there are silver linings that you find that people emerge and uh, the aspiration is for a much better future uh, than they have witnessed or experienced or have heard about. And that's how I was saying the, the story of Rwanda mirrors many other stories of, of African continent, where many countries experience poverty, disease, conflict, hunger. But at the same time, we've seen uh, transformation take place where countries are now developing and there is prosperity coming in. There is peace, there is security, there is entrepreneurship, young people. In my country, 71% uh, of, of our population are under 30 years old. Wow. Yes, 71%. Wow. 71% under 30. Yes. Wow. But that is similar to other parts of the continent. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's close to that. It's about that. It's either between 60 and 70. So in the whole process, everyone is looking for what is it that we can do to uplift ourselves, to take our countries to a higher level, uh, meaning the whole continent is like Rwanda, or Rwanda is like the whole continent is. 
So we want to work together. There is more integration. We are talking about creating uh, common markets. We are talking about working together so that we, we, we can, if you will, catch up with other regions of the world where there are developed countries, uh, uh, countries merging and moving towards uh, development. So that's, that's the struggle of countries. Uh, and we don't allow ourselves to get lost in our history, in our tragedies. Mm. Because if you do that, then that's where you stay. Yeah. Yeah. So what we have tried to do is to make sure that, uh, yes, we have learned lessons with these tragedies, but the lessons should be able uh, to inform us as to how we shape our future. Mm. And that is, and that has also taught people to value not only themselves, but others. In Rwanda, we cannot work toward prosperity, leaving anyone behind. Then it doesn't make sense. So the conversation is, how do we invest in our people? How do we make sure that everyone moves along with us uh, forward? That speaks to the kinds of investments we have made in education, in health, in making sure that there is participation uh, in politics, in the, in the governance. In the, uh, this civic duty that we owe ourselves, which uh, Senator Tim Scott talked about, the civic duty of every individual of our country, and then together collectively being able to move our country forward. In fact, that's how reconciliation comes about. As I said, we don't need to get lost in our past, but rather look forward. So we try to bring all the sectors of our society together to speak with one another, to find value in each other, to be able to move together forward. And I think there has been good progress which uh, is the real foundation of the future we want to share. Yeah. I think that'd be, that'd be something that we, we would love to even hear more about, because oftentimes, um, Senator Scott alluded to in our own nation, we look at a lot of problems, we look at a lot of divisions, we see, um, you know, we, we, we like to point fingers too, right? Yeah. I'm in the private sector, I like to point fingers at the public mm -hmm. sector. Hey, it's the, it's the politicians. The politicians say, hey, it's the business owners. Business owners go, hey, it's the church. Say, hey, it's the education sector. I know you've had three tenets, unity, accountability, and a big vision right. that have served to really unite the nation mm -hmm. and bring, I wonder if you could talk to us some about how it is you've made the opportunity that folks are living into greater than the opposition they have to working with one another. You know, I, I, I also let you know that in many cases when you have talked about unity and working together and bringing everybody to uh, some people have uh, misunderstood us, mm. and we've been greatly criticized uh, for it, because the idea here is the, the people question and say, how do you bring everyone together? Yeah. It's, like, <laughs> it's like people must be different yes. and must behave differently in any way they want. And you don't know how Americans are. It's different. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I, at least I know our own history, and we would learn lessons from that. And, and we've been explaining that I think the, the, there is, a, when you know the theory and, and then want or have experienced real life, you need to bring practical things together with the theories that people know. And living a life is not like a, a, a textbook story. Can be messy in Rwanda as no, well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we, therefore, we are saying 
like in the, the message of reconciliation was people can be different. They can express themselves differently. But if you want to use the difference to harm the other, then there is a problem. Mm -hmm. We need, there has to be an environment, there has to be a situation that does not allow this. Because you are different from me, doesn't mean that uh, you have to be against me or I have to be against you. Mm -hmm. We have to work together because in the end we are one nation. Mm -hmm. So with this background of where some people became victims, others killed and you know, whatever went on in between, we were saying, you, you, you be whatever you want to be. Identify yourself with what you want to identify yourself. Mm -hmm. But if it goes to the level where you can kill somebody because they are different from you, this is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we had to find this line, this dividing line, and make sure that we live by it. And, and, and it's not easy. It's not easy every time because when you were trying reconciliation, there were also people saying, no, but we need justice. Mm. So bringing together reconciliation and justice is probably the most difficult thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but in any case, we would still go ahead and tell the victims who want justice and say, look, bear with us. You are actually the people to ask something from. We can only ask from you reconciliation, forgive. Yes. You, all of us don't have to forget, but you can forgive. Yes. Yeah. But the other, there is not much to ask from them. If you, if you were a perpetrator, if you killed, yeah. what do we ask from you? If you're a perpetrator of a crime, yes. you have nothing to give your no, victim. No, you have nothing point. to give. What do but we ask that victim oh, yes. has that forgiveness victim to give. And forgive. And that forgiving is powerful and it allows a movement forward. Yeah. So we, we, we therefore had to create this balance all the time and uh, keep narrowing the differences mm -hmm. and finding the higher value of what we have to live for and say, why don't we rally towards that? Maintain we are different anyway, even if we didn't want to be, yeah. we are, but you can also decide how you live within and with your differences. Yeah. Uh, so that commonly you benefit from that. And that's, that's the, the, the complexity of the situation you have had to manage. And. Uh, as I, as I said, when we say unity, unity coming together, it's yeah. like people don't understand it. They say, why, why, why do you want unity? Why don't you let people become different from each other? And you say, fine, people can be different from each other. Yeah. They can express their differences, if you will. Yeah. But at the same time, we can't allow a certain line to be crossed. Right. Because if you cross it, then you go to the tragedy we had in Rwanda. We can maintain unity of purpose. Absolutely. Right. While having differences of approach. So therefore, that's, from that, that's how we came to talking about unity. But of course, unity with accountability. Yeah. And then, what else do we do after that? We have to think of how do we prepare ourselves, our nation, forward as fast as we can and uh, be where others are. When we look at uh, developed countries, look at here in the United States, we ask ourselves, they say, why can't we be like uh, United States? Well, please be better. Yeah. Please be better. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, the people, the people. <laughs> Whatever you may blame uh, yourselves for, maybe it's politics, yeah. but it's not the people. Yeah. Yeah. So people, Later on, how they decide to manage themselves, that's a different issue, but they have achieved this level of development that everyone wants to aspire to. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Your, your vision of unity and accountability um, are fabulous, but what they provide for, I think, is what gets me most excited, and probably many of the men and women in this room most excited, which is a big vision, a big dream. Right. Um, 
I love about Rwanda that, that you're not the largest nation in Africa. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? There, yes. there, are, there are nations with many more people, Absolutely. larger economies, more yes. territory, yep. yet you're setting a standard and a standard of excellence and leading the way in now one of the largest continents in the world. Right. I think for those of us that call Charlotte home, we, we see some parallels, we hope, maybe for, that, that we could live up to. And they, well, while we might not be mm -hmm. the largest city in America, while we might not have the most That's right. folks, the most territory, uh, we might not be the one that uh, you know, foreign dignitaries visit the most often, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity if, if we commit to unity of purpose, mm -hmm. if we commit to accountability with one another, and then we have a big vision for what that could mean for, for our nation to see a city really come together right. to transform the experience of all people. Because I love what you said that, that man, we, we say sometimes as the tide rises, all the ships in the harbor rise with it. Mm -hmm. right? As the tide comes in, all the ships rise. And what I heard you say is, hey, in Rwanda, man, as we have success, everyone needs to be included right. in that success and lifted up. I wonder if you could share some about your big vision for, for Rwanda today. Well, let me, Rwanda let, let me I, I share with you this. Uh, in, there is, um, for example, in the area of doing business, there is an index that was created by the World Bank in 2004. Ease of doing business across the world. Around the world. We started uh, as number 150, meaning <laughs> Rwanda. Number 150 in the world, meaning among the last. Then today, we are number 29 Ooh. in the world. Yeah. Uh, number two in, in Africa. Wow. Number two in wow. Africa, number 29 in the world. Wow. In fact, in the world, as the fastest reforming country in the world. The number one. Wow. So, as you rightly said, we are not anywhere near to being uh, one of the biggest countries you, you could think of. Yeah. Absolutely not. We are a very small landlocked country in the heart of Africa, 12 million people with all the complicated history that uh, we are talking about. So this can only come out of looking beyond your size, your location, your, uh, and saying what, what is it in terms of values, what, what, what is it that is going to drive us, that is going to raise us to the level where we want to be. And that is the choice we, 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 we made. In fact, I've, I've told people so several times that in our complicated history and geography and everything, and politics, the only way we have succeeded in this, as shown by the progress we made, for example, in the index of doing business, we said, we have to make choices, mm -hmm. even the difficult choices, about what we want to do and want to achieve and where we want to be. We don't follow rules. We follow choices. We, there is no rule book for us. You know, there is a tendency that the world has a rule book. Everyone reads from and say, we are going to do like this. No, we say, no. For us, we have the freedom to make the choices. You can read the rule book, you can do whatever you want, but we finally make the choices. Which way do we want to go? How do we go there? How do we bring everyone to come around these choices? And then uh, if things work for us, we gain from that, we celebrate, we are happy, we move on. If they don't work for us, we don't blame anybody. <laughs> we just look back and say, where did you get it wrong? Yeah. How can we correct it? And, and uh, so that we 
don't make other people's mistakes mm. in the end, because we have had this kind of uh, relationships in the world where people come and dictate to you what you must do. Yeah. In the end, when things go wrong, it's you. <laughs> it's not them. Even if you actually yeah. did what they told you to do, yeah. Yeah. they'll be the ones to turn around and blame you for yeah. it. So this is, these are lessons we have learned through these hardships, and uh, so we, we, we keep going forward on that. Keep a posture of learning, keep innovating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, throw out the rules. Yeah. I like that one a lot. So women. Can I use that at my house? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> women uh, in, in our country, 52% uh, of our population, they stand at, uh, 61, 62 now percent yeah. of our parliamentarians. Yeah. The parliament is 62 percent women. 62. Yeah. yeah. Come on, women. Come on. Thank you, Pamela Powell. Another woman in the audience stand up. I think my, my wife was standing up with her. <laughs> we have 50 percent of our cabinet, the ministers. Yes. Cabinet ministers are women, 50%. Yeah. We, we have 44% in the judiciary, in the system. 44%. 44%. Yes. I want to make sure you guys are catching all these stats because there's been some clapping, but you could, you could do a little more justice. This was 62% of parliamentarians, yes. women. 50% yes. of his cabinet, women. And 42% of judicial officials in the nation. Yes. 44. 44. Yes. Thank you, Harvard. Thank you. I was with Tim. I, we were <laughs> <laughs> so we can go on and on and on. But what I'm trying to say is that um, while people are struggling to yeah. give justice to our societies, when it comes to women, and we find in most cases are uh, marginalized. This is one area we also concentrated on and made sure that uh, they are part and parcel of the whole society as we move forward. And by the way, they have equal pay. Equal pay. For, for, for equal pay. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Come on. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. <laughs> Beautiful, beautiful. No, so, that, that. Isn't this fun, making new friends? Yeah. I mean, isn't this fun? Is this not fun? If you're not enjoying like, getting to hear stories from around the world, being encouraged by other nations, <laughs> other great leaders that are, I mean, I, I, I will bet that you walked into this room and you've already taken some things away that you had no idea about, you didn't know about, man. Just the gift of this time together has been So in, in our small place, in a place many people don't know, maybe here in Charlotte, people know Rwanda, but if you went to some other place, you just say, where, where is that? Or what is that? Not, but, not too many. I think we're, we're sitting, we're, we're gifted to sit with you know, the, the man that Forbes made the most uh, influential leader in Africa. Mm -hmm. So just appreciate the gift that we're receiving during this time and the great, hard, pioneering work that you and, and the people of Rwanda have done for, for 30 years. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, I think, a beacon of light to us. It's a place of hope for us and a lot to learn. We have uh, children. Enrollment rate of the first 12 years of education is 90 uh, percent. So I'm sorry, say one 90 percent of the 12 years okay. primary and secondary education. 90 percent graduation. 90 percent wow. enrollment rate. Could we, could, could we talk about that one for just a moment? Because I've yes. read some of what you've said about the power of education. Yes. The power of education. Yes. And the power of education to transform poverty and then to give I can, children I opportunity. Could first give you more. We have 87% of our population has uh, health insurance coverage. Wow. Wow. 87%. 87% of the yes. population. Yes. We... Now, we were talking about thinking or dreaming big and doing yeah. different things. We talked about the power of technology, of innovation, and investing in uh, human capital. We also, for example, in our health system, we are able to 
distribute uh, medicines, especially vital medicines to rural areas, and uh, vaccines or blood samples required by drones. We use drones to deliver to the remote <laughs> So wow. what, what would, take, would have taken a six hours drive, yeah. uh, six hours, three hours, and so we, we, the drone would take about uh, maybe for the six hours, 30 minutes. Wow. Yes. Wow. A 30 minute drone So this flight. has, yes, it has. Uh, so there are many of these things which we've been trying to put together despite our history and everything, we, we, we are really driven to leave this past far behind us mm. without uh, forgetting it, but wanting to move as fast, as fast forward as we can. And, and I so you can talk about education you wanted. Yeah, to I want to hear about education, but I'd love to just hammer that, that point you made of, of um, said without forgetting, yes. without forgetting. And without forgetting what we've come from, because in, in many ways, um, the stories I've heard from, from, from pastors and friends who have come and shared some of the stories of reconciliation and the, the rebuilding work of Rwanda were anchored actually in the pain. Right. They, they were anchored in, in an understanding of what can happen if mm -hmm. racism and classism are allowed to persist. Mm -hmm. And then the devastating results that those things can lead to, and then, and then an even more redoubled commitment to seeing those things put aside to seeing forgiveness happen in society. And, and so in many ways, I think you, you'd never want to forget, right? That, 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 that forget. incredible yes. lessons that you all learned. And we have seen this permeate throughout the levels of society. Yeah. Even ordinary people in their rural settings understand this message. And we've been talking to one another about this message. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. It seems uh, everyone gets it. Yeah. And it is also has become uh, a driver of uh, what we are trying to do and achieve for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I did, I have a selfish question. I yes. get to be up here, so I get one, and we're gonna allow some folks, I think, to ask some, some other questions, um, yeah. if we have time for that, Andy, a couple, couple questions. But mine so, was around, is around education. Um, it's something I've been passionate about. And uh, in the U.S., look at the, the education of school as an institution in our society that actually provides a pathway, an on-ramp into opportunity for children that are born into poverty. Mm -hmm. And so we've been, we've been very active in trying to think through how to bring educational opportunities to um, children born into, into poverty in the United States. I've read um, some of what you've written about the importance of education, of helping lift children and actually just kind of create generational opportunity um, in Rwanda. Would you share some of your perspectives uh, on the importance of education and the role it's played in this um, story? Well, education is, is uh, the most important investment we can make in our people, as, as is very clear, I think, to everyone. Like, in our case, Rwanda, we aren't uh, as much uh, endowed with the natural resources or you know, some of the things, you know, big countries have. But we, we've focused on what we know is our main asset, our main resource, that is our people. So education is even more important in this sense, that when you have equipped somebody with education, that tool takes this person anywhere they want to go. And therefore, you imagine from the person to a nation, it's the same thing. It takes the nation wherever it wants to be, uh, just with the, the investment in education. But of course, with education alone, I mean, you need uh, people with good health. Mm -hmm. So that's why for us, in fact, uh, between education and health, this share uh, about 30 percent of our uh, national budget. Healthcare and education. Yes, 30 percent. Wow. So every year, year in, year out. So this is how we, we value education. So with education, you don't go wrong. It's mm. an investment that 
doesn't go wrong. Investment people. Absolutely. There's no question about it. Fabulous. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to give the audience the gift of uh, some questions. So, Andy, start us off. Hi. Um, my name is Allison Shigo, and um, I actually had the privilege of being in Rwanda in 2008. Um, I worked on a film called Women, Power, and Politics, and I fell in love with your country. It's absolutely beautiful. And uh, I also, like you said, really fell in love with the women there who are doing so much and have come against such odds and, and really have lost their entire families and yet had the conviction and strength to serve and to want to be part of rebuilding the country. Um, I was also very impressed by the women in business. So many women that ended up starting their own businesses or taking over businesses after they lost their husbands. And so my question is, in terms of investment and economic growth in Rwanda, um, where do you see the greatest opportunity for women and women business, uh, women business owners? Um, yeah, thank you. Well, for, for women, the, the way we have been approaching it, which I, we thought was fair enough, is first of all, we concentrate on making sure that these gaps that have been there in the past between men and women uh, are narrowed. And we, but as we do that, we also want to create, uh, to, to, to invest in our society as a whole and stop this whole thing of investing in women alone or investing mm. in men alone. Mm. We just narrow the gap and then allow every Rwandan to move forward. Uh, so in, in the programs that have been there to encourage women to go into business and even support them, uh, there are women organizations that are local to our situation. So they have uh, been getting access to capital for them to be able to do different uh, things as they wish, in as far as filling this gap also is concerned. And then there is the whole umbrella where we want to facilitate every Rwandan to be able to do business, mm -hmm. not just putting all the resources or concentrating on women alone. But the, 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 the initial effort of investing in their education, women education, and again, education in general, keeps helping us to narrow this gap and then having to realize everyone being able to move forward. Like we have created uh, uh, business development centers, uh, centers across the whole country uh, by district, these business development centers are aimed at developing business people, men, or women, or entrepreneurs, and sharing ideas with them how they can improve their, on their businesses or how they can start businesses and so on. So, and this, now women have access to that. Initially, women did not have access to anything. They didn't have access to capital, they didn't have access to education, they didn't have access to all these other programs that were there. So we, we've been simply concentrating on one, eliminating these gaps, two, then are going together uh, forward. Mr. President, we're really glad to have you here. I'm Jennifer Roberts. I was the mayor of Charlotte until two years ago. And um, we are so grateful to be able to learn from each other. I'm very interested in your emphasis on education. And s specifically, we'd love to hear more about how you are working with technology. Because one of the challenges we have here is that we have 20,000 households in our public school system where the children have no computer at home and no internet access. Mm -hmm. And that digital divide is exacerbating the income gap and the wealth gap with the rich and the poor, with minority students, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I know that Africa has struggled with infrastructure and technology, so I'd love to hear more yes. about how you've confronted that Absolutely. issue. Thank you. I think that's a good question. We, we, we have. Uh, 
also identified uh, technology as uh, uh, indispensable enabler in all of these things, whether education or health, as we are talking about. So what we did, we have invested in infrastructure that we support technologies. For example, in our country, we have um, laid fiber about 4,000 kilometers length of fiber across the country to districts, to then later on to homes and yep. other premises. The second, uh, tw about close to 15 years ago now, uh, close to 15 years, we invested with uh, somebody, who, uh, Professor Negroponte of MIT. We worked with him. He had developed uh, a computer, a laptop, uh, rugged and, you know, that has many uh, applications to it that would help kids learn computers. And we had a project called One Laptop Per Child. So our ambition was to have every child, school going uh, child, with a laptop in his hands or her hands. We had 2.3, we have roughly now 2.3 million children uh, going for primary school and lower secondary school. So we, under this arrangement, we acquired, we had wanted everyone to have a computer in their hands, but we could only afford something like uh, 600,000 in such a short time, because we had to pay for it ourselves, the government. So what we did anyway, we converted it to the situation where now kids would share computers, so that maybe one computer per every six Children. And that means uh, on Monday, one child will go with the computer. Tuesday, they go home with the computer. Third, another one on Wednesday, then, and so on. So that it rotates. So that every, every kid has hands on the computer at least once every week because they have their turns and so on. As we increase the numbers so that everyone can. So, but what we found out was that kids with computers in their hands. Apart from what they are taught at school, they are able to teach themselves so much. In fact, one time they come to school ahead of their teachers sometimes. <laughs> uh, in fact, there's this a very interesting story around this. When we had just brought in computers, they put them in the stores, and then they had to take teachers for training, and so on and so forth. But the, teacher, the kids said, no, but why don't you give us computers while you're still training the... So they actually, we, we told the schools to allow kids to go home with their computers. First time. Breaking rules. Yes, but when the, when the teachers were undergoing training for three weeks, by the time they came back, the kids were ahead of them. Wow. <laughs> Love so it. they were able to, <laughs> so th th that is how we are only limited in a way by, you know, not having always sufficient means, but we already have a, a good measure of what technology does and what kids, young people are able to do once they are given this opportunity. It's self-evident and we just keep trying to do more and better and move on. Fabulous. Hello, I'm Tamara Park. And in 2009, I did a television series where I trekked through Africa and what the West could learn from Africa. And when I got to Rwanda, I was so struck by your spirit of innovation. So just building on your question, I was wondering, was that a united vision to bring the country together through innovation? It, it seemed like that was contagious when I was there in 2009. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, thank you. The, the ideas come from different people, different parts of uh, society, but 
quickly identified as something that is useful to the nation. So we ran around it and cut out mobilization. And especially we are helped by demonstration of some of the successes or progress that are made in the course of doing what uh, has been uh, chosen to be done. So that, that's why, so in Rwanda, that's why I said there is a silver lining in one sense. On one hand, you know, history, a country torn apart, so divided, and so on. Now, today is another extreme. People rallying together, coming together about around everything that has been identified as something that can, you know, improve their lives and take them forward for people to come around what has been identified as working and productive for us, I, I don't think it happens uh, anywhere else at a faster rate. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I, I tend to connect the two. It's, it's one extreme le leading to another extreme. Yes, it's like people want to leave this uh, extreme division and hate and the misery that came with it and death and so on. It's like they, they are so eager to leave this behind to something that can now restore uh, some sense of sanity, if you will, and being together and doing things that uh, should have been in place in the first place. OK, we have time for one more. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much, President Kagame, for your track record in Africa, particularly looking at the journey from where Rwanda was and where it is today. I have a couple of questions. You mentioned the importance of education. First of all, I just want to hear from you. Uh, I know you have a great mind. Who is an educated person, right, from your perspective? Who is an educated person? And the next question is, this year in the United States, in August, particularly the 19th, it will be 400 years since the first enslaved Africans. Since? 400 years since the first enslaved Africans yes. arrived in English America. And it is a historic moment, an opportunity for real reconciliation within the United States across race, class and the like. Beyond the first question of who is an educated person, would you consider bringing your lesson from the pilot of Rwanda, deep in the heart of Africa, to help and bring about reconciliation in the United States? Thank you. There are two parts of uh, education, if I may attempt to answer your question. One part is with the modern societies. That are, you need, you, you learn to read, to write, it's languages, it's science, it's technology, it's all kinds of things that uh, as things have evolved in our world, there is that process they call learning, education, and so on. You, you learn a language that you did not speak, somebody else's. That is, or even if you start with learning your own, because when people are born and growing up, they don't know even their own languages. They learn their own languages. And others. You, then you learn mathematics. You learn all kinds of disciplines. So that's one part. It, it, it is almost taken for granted that people who want to, as they grow up, as they develop, you learn these things. Now, education, per se, has another nuance in addition to that. 
education or learning, maybe I can combine both of them. An educated person is therefore, you've got this knowledge. What, what, what do you use it, where, how do you use it? What do you use it for? Yes. What, what, what in, in solving a problem? Your own or society's problem. So there are these two parts, therefore, in my view, the educated person is the one who has had the traditional school process, but at the same time, how do you transition from that to making a good use of it? And they add good use of it. Yes, then you are educated. This is what I see as an educated person. Uh, Maybe that, that is the best I can say about it. Now, for the other part, you know, in many ways, reconciliation, or, as I said, there are many problems across the world, and unfortunately, we have had our fair share of problems in the world. <laughs> meaning Rwanda. We've learned from that. We have tried to change things in our own country to address what the problem was. There are other problems in other parts of the world, and people there struggle to address their own problems. I, I, I would wish to say that uh, I can't pretend or Rwanda wouldn't or shouldn't pretend to say because we, the only thing that comes from Rwanda is if we have overcome some of these extreme cases of, you know, problems, it should give hope to anyone else that they can overcome their own problems. That's the only thing I can say, but I, I, I don't think we have lessons we can take to other people and say, if you do this, that will solve your problem. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I, 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 so people with those problems have to make these hard choices I started with when I was talking about that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and decide which way to go with addressing the challenges before them. Uh, well, if they want to make a reference to say, look, Rwanda did it, and they were at the lowest level of any nation in their lifetime. But they have risen out of that and are here. It's like the, the main thing is, if Rwanda has done it, what, what reasons do we have not to try and overcome these challenges ourselves? Mm -hmm. Yes, that is the only thing I, can. I, I, I can't tell people that, you know, because we did this and have made this progress, you should do the same. I think what I, what I appreciate what I heard in the question um, was one, hey, what is an educated man? And what I heard you say was an educated man who's received knowledge, he's received teaching, he's received training. The question, though, if that educated man or woman becomes effective is what they do with it. Yes. What they do with the investment they've received. Mm -hmm. right? And similarly, I think today, you know, we've received, we've received, right, we've received some instruction, we've received an example, we've received a story yeah. of a nation that's gone about the hard work of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. You know, the question for us is we, as we do remember the past, because right, we need to be anchored in the truth of the past and have clarity on it, as we do remember the past, yeah. what are we going to do with these great lessons we've learned? Right? Yeah. What are we going to do? How are we going to put these to action? How are we going to steward this investment that you've made in us today? Absolutely. Right, so I don't think you want to be alone. I don't no, think you want to be the only nation not. that's pursuing no, no, innovation. Absolutely the only not. nation that's <laughs> lifting up women in power. The only nation that's, true. that's leading the way in prosperity and absolutely. innovation. You don't want to be alone in this. Absolutely. That's and why, in fact, uh, we share our own experiences with uh, all the African countries. Yes. Yes, we, we across. In fact, recently I have had the opportunity to lead the African Union, that's about 55 countries. Uh, I have been the chairman of the, that organization, the African Union, for
for 12 months. And throughout the 12 months, my message was just as, as we are discussing here. It's like Rwanda is part of you. Mm. Yeah. We are you and you are us as Africans. Yeah. This is what we went through. Well, even before you tell them, they tell you because they know that. And they want to say, how have you come from here to this point? And we tell them the story. The only thing is to tell the story and say, this is how we did it. It may work for you, it may not work for you the same way, but certain, there are certain things, at least in terms of mindset, in terms of a mentality that is developed, and the choices you make, mm -hmm. and the lessons learned, you can, anybody can solve their problems. Mm -hmm. yes. But nobody is going to come to address your problem. Yeah. No. It doesn't, you can even, we have had this experience and we tell our friends and partners, we say sometimes they have come with lessons to, to you know, teach us how to, and then we humbly told them we appreciate you. you know, yeah. <laughs> we appreciate your support and your sympathy and uh, uh, willing to be with us, but this life here lived by these Rwandans, they can only be the ones to lead the way in addressing it. Yeah. The rest will just be help, support, sympathy, and, mm -hmm. but you, 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 you don't want to replace anybody in addressing their own problems. Yeah. You can't substitute them. <laughs> don't rob them no, of no, that no. gift <laughs> to address them. Yeah, and the dignity they found therein. It, it, now Rwanda is a nation that's looked yeah. up to around the world as an example yeah. of what it looks like yeah. to create all these attributes that we would love to have, whereas yeah. three decades ago that wasn't the case. But you weren't we, robbed of it, it was done yourself. Absolutely. We can only share ideas, experiences, and, but when it comes to doing what makes the difference, it's you to do it. Well, Your Excellency, as you said to the African Union that Rwanda is part of you, I would say to you, hey, Rwanda is part of us, yeah. part of us. We're part of a global, mm -hmm. <laughs> right, a global people group. And I thank you, brother, for coming and sharing your story that has benefited us so greatly. And my challenge, I think, to all of us, our challenge here today is, is to take and receive the, these teachings we've, we've had, take and receive the hard lessons that Rwanda has learned and has modeled for all of us. Take this picture of hope, this picture of transformation, this picture of what can be, <clears throat> and move forward together in unity and accountability yeah. and with a big vision, yeah. with a big vision of what we could collectively do together. Somewhat a nation, you know, Africa needing a vision. I think our nation needs a vision. Our nation needs a vision of a city that rises up, that comes together, that looks pragmatically at problems not from political ideologies, but really from a solutions learning based big, orientation. Big countries need even a bigger vision. <laughs> <laughs> Charlotte, please join me in thanking His Excellency <laughs> President Paul Kagame, Rwanda.